welcome to another class at the Root Institute. Uh, we're here today with Morgan Jerkins, who is a writer, senior writer at The Undefeated. She is the author of uh, Wandering in Strange Lands and the new novel. Well, I don't know, is April still new? It's relatively new. She's the best selling author of Call a Novel. Uh, and also Bakari Sellers, who is political commentator, all around superstar, uh, lawyer, justice fighter. I um, think he was just inducted as the first male member of the Dora Milaje. Uh, uh, and he is also the author of My Vanishing Country. And we're here to talk about, you know, telling our stories and, you know, retracing our steps is the title of this, this conversation. And we're basically talking about telling our stories that for so long, our stories, the stories of black people have been kind of told through the lens of white people, uh, as they say, the victors write history. And so, you know, in America, our stories have mostly for the most of our history been told by the people who colonized this country and control the narrative and so we but now we're in a space where we get to tell our own stories we don't know how long it'll last and we want to talk to you about how long and how we can continue to do this so let me first start with uh, you morgan uh in wandering in strange lands because you know i'd like to hear about how you came up with the idea for the book uh and you know if you were always interested in being a historian or, or, or untracing that story, uncovering that story, or was it just a personal idea? So actually the initial catalyst for Wandering in Strange Lands came through a movie. Um, it's a little film, I don't know if y'all heard of it, it's called Get Out. Um, and I was watching it in Magic Johnson Theater in Harlem at night. The climactic scene where Daniel Kaluuya's character's hand is wrapped around Allison Williams' throat and the police car pulls up and immediately everyone gasped. It was perhaps one, it was perhaps one of the most profound cinematic experiences of my life because in any other circumstance, if I would have went to the Upper West Side or whatever, people would have been like, oh, thank God. But we as Black people knew that that meant trouble. I initially spoke to my publisher at Harper um, about talking about these different threads of fear and superstition in African-American communities. But actually, when I spoke to two scholars, um, Dr. Kendra Field and Dr. Carrie Greenwich, um, both Boston-based Black women, when I told them about this, they were like, oh, you're making a migration story. This sounds more like a migration story. I have always been interested in family history, but I will be honest with you and tell you that my own family history was very, very narrow. I was raised by a single parent in South Jersey um, and all my parents and my grandparents talked about was South Jersey. I didn't even know my grandparents were born. In fact, it wasn't the creation of this book that I found out that my grandfather was born in Georgia. I never knew it. And it made me wonder about their traje their trajectories um, compared to my father's trajectories and how when they moved north, so much had been lost. I had grown up in a community where the food we ate, you know, the collard greens and the black eyed peas on New Year's, um, the certain superstitions we had, I would always say, why do we do these things? And they'd always say, just what black people do. And I wasn't uh, satisfied with that answer. I'm a very curious person. I'm a, I'm a Gemini. So in my mind, I was like, okay, there seems to be some gaps in our cultural memory that's going on. My mother can't answer it. My grandparents can't answer it. So what I wanted to do was to go back for them. It's a foreign concept to me of like not knowing where your grandparents came from. When I was a kid, like probably about once a month, I lived about 20 miles from where my great, great grandparents were enslaved. And most of, a lot of my family on my grandmother's side still lived there, right? So about once a month, my aunts would just take us down there and it would be so boring because we just hear them, they just talk, right? And I didn't realize until probably a year or so ago that I was absorbing that and like 
I knew so much of my history and how unusual it was for us because our history has displaced us and has been robbed from us. So Bakari, you know, knowing your story, having read your book and knowing it more intimately, you know, how was your family story, you know, uh, relate to you? I can imagine that your father's story, you know, plays front and center in your life, but the other parts of it, how did you absorb those things? So it's funny that we're sitting here having this conversation uh, because my story is a, is a little bit different than uh, uh, Morgan's in that uh, we we remained on these ancestral lands. It's a lot. My, my story is more comparable to yours, Michael, because you're, you're in that Darlington, Florence, Hartsville area where we're in Denmark, South Carolina. And, um, you know, I, we, we trace our um, heritage back to the coast of Charleston. We know that we came in from the west coast of Africa. We know that it was brothers who came in and they were called littles when they got here and then they separated and went to different parts of South Carolina. I think the reason we were taught that is because my father was taught that, but even more importantly, my father began the quest um, during the period, which I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with, in which on many college campuses, Africana studies became a thing. And a part of that becoming a thing was knowing who you were. And so there was a lot of research and in-depth study done because my father actually ended up at South Carolina State before the Orangeburg Massacre. And what he was trying to do was get Africana studies to be an implement, implemented on the campus. And you saw people doing it, some, some are more legendary than others, Manning Marble and the scholars go on and on and on. But this is what they were attempting to do. And a part of that was knowing thyself. And so it's just interesting when I was writing my book, these weren't, you know, I didn't necessarily have to do all of the research uh, to go back that far. It was really just sitting down and dumping, you know, dumping it out of my head. It's interesting, you know, you might hear us kind of refer to each other, but like Bakari's family and my family knew each other before we even met. So, uh, so, you know, I know we hear the phrase all the time, like black people are not a monolith, but it's so true because, you know, how this country displaced some of us, how some of us were we managed to stay put. It's kind of a unique American experience that's kind of separate from the rest of American history in that we created our own path. Like it wasn't something that we were bequeathed from Europe or we didn't in, you know, inherit, inherit this, this uh, royalty that America bestowed upon, you know, the first people, the founding fathers of the old families. We kind of made these things that um, we are, like our, our parents and our grandparents kind of created us in this world out of whole cloth. And I, I want to ask you, Morgan, how do you think, you know, having traveled and, and learned about this diaspora, how do you think it informs who we are today, like as people, as a political or social entity in this country. I think what what is interesting about the time period that we're in is like the past is speaking to us in many different ways. Whether it's finding a picture of the last enslaved person um in this country, learning about the bones um found in Tulsa because of the massacre there. Um me and Bakari's books, for example, personal accounts of that type of history, um, us invoking our ancestors more. There seems to be this cosmic call and response that's happening in our mo in our current zeitgeist that I'm really excited about. But also, I think it's informing us that everything isn't always written down, as you started off saying with this interview. One of the biggest barriers I had to get past as I was writing, writing Wandering was that people were telling me things and I was hearing it from many other different people across generations, but I couldn't find it. And then when I would write down my accounts of what I saw, I was even afraid that when I took it back to my publisher, they, they wouldn't believe it. And I think what helps inform us as a people is that there are many different truths. We can't just take what's written down as just a solid fact. 
And even if something is disputable, right? There's still a root there. There's a kernel of some type of truth hidden in that that informs the way we live, that they live then and the way we live now. You know, there are names in your book, uh, in both of your books, whose children will never get to have an autobiography, right? But, it, and you know, when you think about what we know of history, all of those people didn't have autobiographies or we didn't find diaries of them. We found a bit of that from one writer and a bit of that from one writer we able to piece together a thing, right? And that is the history kind of that was taken from us. Like we didn't have the chance to document our histories except through the voices of, of other people. And Bakari, you know, what's interesting about it is you, your family kind of had, was stood on the precipice of having that history of race when, you know, when your father was incarcerated, um, you know, they wanted to incarcerate him for much longer, for much Forever. worse yeah. crimes. And that history could have been, you know, a race unless, you know, you, there's the possibility that you could have been vigilant about it and, you know, gone and visit and gathered that story in other ways. But do you ever think about how that could have been lost and, and like pushing, pushing that forward to make sure that you never have to face that? Right. That, that is, that is a part of the root cause of my anxiety, which is one of the best chapters in my book where I talk about anxiety being a black man's superpower. Because that anxiety, you know, my anxiety is 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 rooted in a fear of death and failure. Those are the two two biggest things. And the death is just thinking about the moment my father was shot in the shoulder. There was a possibility that you know he he wouldn't be here. And um, you know, your life gets cut short. You're not able to complete that story or complete God's work. You know, and so I think about those things often. Um, and it, it's why I live 24 hours at a time. Like my job is to make the most of today. I want this panel that we're doing to be that impactful so that if somebody sees it in 20 years, they're able to say, at least he was able to string together a subject and a verb and he knew who he was, right? One of the other things that we did so often, I, I bring up Kwanzaa, but there, there were also proverbs that we held true. Like it takes a village to raise a child, right? And we were so, um, we clung to that proverb so much, or we cling to that proverb so much that it helps us um, do the best we can to tell our stories. So for me, like when I write in my book about Marion Barry and my admiration for, Eric, for Marion Barry, you know, it's not something that I just heard. Uh, it's not something that I just read on, on Beyonce's internet, right? This is something that I knew from having conversations with him, from picking up the phone and being able to talk to him. And just to kind of keep that essence of that village, I think it's so important as we share our stories. And I think that we have to begin to share those stories and share those experiences and live by those old proverbs. Morgan, it's, you know, one of the things I want to get into is how we, you know, because all of us don't have the privilege of kind of being able to hear the word from the mouths of our elders, um, how we retrace these roots and these steps. Um, so tell me, how did you go about taking the first steps to even find out any of this information? So in terms of my ancestors, I definitely spoke to the oldest people in my family. And I asked them, what were their parents' names or where did they grow up? Um, and, and along the way, as older black people are, they tend to use that biographical detail with a lot of, uh, funny anecdotes, very lively anecdotes. And I'll just let them talk. I don't interrupt them, even though I'm like, okay, what point are they getting at? Because some way or another, as you know, with black orders, they're going to find a way to loop it all together. So a lot of times I would just sit at a table with my recorder and hear them talk. And a lot of times they always say, I don't remember, or I, it's a little fuzzy. And I would say, it's okay. Just tell me what you remember as best as you can. And then what I do is after I get those recordings and I had someone who helped me transcribe them, 
Then I start parsing out what they were talking about. What type of plants did they grow? What do they remember growing up? What type of things that their people used to do there? All these other sorts of attributes. And like, okay, let's look at the history of where they grew up there at that particular time and start building out a larger narrative in order to fill in those gaps. One of the most important things we can do, and Morgan said it, I mean, I think we need to start in our own families, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And we need to sit down with our grandparents while they're still alive and our uncles mm -hmm. and grandparents. And just write down their stories. I mean, I, my Aunt Gwen and Uncle Milton, I love them to death. I think they're, I want to say born in 41 or 42. So what does that make them? Mm -hmm. 79, yeah. 80. Um, went yeah, to my North grandpa Carolina. was born in 743. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, oh, wait a minute. I, that was, that was my uncle. My, grand, my, my daddy was born in 44. My daddy must be old. So anyway, um, but we gotta we gotta begin to go and, and sit with them and tell their stories, right? And write their stories and at least take their notes about their stories. I think because when I mean that generation of Brown versus the Board of Education babies are are dying. My mother as well, she didn't even know where her dad was born. She didn't know about why the reason they migrated in the first place, which was the fact that her great grandfather hit a white man with his car and didn't know it was at night. They didn't know if he was dead or alive and they had to get out. And I heard stories like that from coast to coast. My dad, my dad, he was, he, he, he had a temper. He didn't want to cross the street, you know, go to the other sidewalk and got in a fight with a white man, pick up immediately and go. And it's that, complete like that that second that changes someone's family's history forever that's the things that i wanted to capture in there but when my grandfather was expounding upon being young um when my mother said to him you know why is it that you never told me he said no one asked right right and and some of those histories are lost because just like you said like leaving town because you hit a white man with your car. My great, 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 great grandfather was run out of town. Like he was freed at, by his master's death because he was just a troublemaker on the plantation. And he kept making trouble by sneaking onto the plantation and having enslaved people give him like little bits of tobacco to teach their kids and selling them he would sell them at the market and everybody was couldn't figure out how this dude kept getting his tobacco and they ran him out of town right they just chased him out of actually they killed his father and then they ran him out of town like they like on the steps of the darlington county courthouse um they i mean the newspapers say they seized upon him you can go to the county courthouse too a a a judge friend of mine was having court in Bamberg County and was in the clerk's office. And um, I guess he was just being nosy. He pulled up the cellars and there was an article about my grandfather's brother. So that makes him my grand uncle who was arrested on a Sunday uh, in a church for being uh, drunk and belligerent. And he got kicked out of church and he had done it multiple and I sent the article to my, my aunt and my daddy and my aunt did not find it funny at all, but I just found it to be one of the most hilarious things. And they had a write-up of him. It was like from 1920 um, that he was, he, he, I think it was uh, Peter Sellers was uh, drunk and belligerent in church and got kicked out again. So when you kind of stumble across this, right, what, like how do you put it together what does what does it take like like let's say you're not writing a book right let's just say you just you just want to know where you came from how do you put that together into completing the puzzle uh morgan let's ask you first Part, parts of the story is tough because just like any family there's scandal and intrigue so my dad's side of the family <laughs> My dad's side of the family is originally from Louisiana. And I actually was so trying to figure out my earliest ancestors in Louisiana. And I was always told that there was a, a, a man named Matterin and a woman named Carrie, and they were married and had kids and so on and so forth. I went down to the courthouse 
in St. Martinville, Louisiana, and could find no marriage record on them. Okay. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. I had a cousin of mine. It's funny. I actually found another cousin through Ancestry.com who had a full tree that she had been working on for like 20 years. So she had been doing work and she was stumped as well. Um, so again, this is, I actually found an autobiographical book or pamphlet by a cousin of mine from years ago, David DeWitt Stewart Pro. And he talks about Matter and Carrie. And he says that when she died, he stood at the, the cemetery gate. He didn't go in. And I thought, if a man has been with a woman and had kids with her and she's transitioning, why wouldn't he be at the actual ceremony? So then I started researching a little bit more and I was like, I basically came to the conclusion that their relationship was illicit. Something was, it was not supposed to be. And even in the text, my great cousin says he kept one family on the bayou and he kept one on the other. Like, oh, okay, I see what's going on. They weren't actually married. You know what I mean? So my thing is when it comes to situations like that, who's, who's, whose child is this? Who's, you know, is, were these people actually married? A lot of times you're not going to be, you're not going to nail it hundred percent. A lot of times it's just taking what you get, like, as you said before, taking like what you get in terms of a mosaic or a quilt and taking some probable guesses of what happened here. How do you, but how do you, when you come to an impasse where there is like a written record or the official narrative on one side and what these folks say on the other side. I'll give you an example. Um, I mean, Bakari knows this, right? Like, so if you talk about the Orangeburg massacre, well, there's kind of no real official narrative, but you know, if you ask, I would say 80% of the white people in South Carolina who heard, who know about it, right? They will say that there was a big riot between the police and the students at South Carolina State and the police shot the students. And the people who were there and the people who are still alive who know the story know that's not the case, right? But if you, for instance, or taking it to a publisher or taking it to a, or a journalist, it's kind of hard, like, it, because we still live in a white world where white people's word is paramount, right? So, like, how do you, like, Bakari, for instance, like, knowing that, like, I was at an impasse in, in researching your father's story and then, you know, I, like, reached out to you and you said, oh, yeah, they just thought he looked like you know, Henry Smith. And that was a big key, but that's not in any piece of research that you'll find. But then when I, when you told me that, like all the other people was like, oh yeah, they were, they thought they were shooting another guy. And that's how the whole thing started. But how do you reach that impasse when there is an official version of the story that's accepted and perpetuated throughout history and it becomes the official version and you know the thing that all of the folks are saying whose words weren't written down but it was passed along you know this is the truth because like different sources told you how do you kind of create like dispel the official narrative and create the true narrative the true story that's the hardest thing i mean i think that's what we're trying to do i mean we're literally rewriting history right so um there are a lot of things that i'm doing right now in my effort to rewrite history i mean when i was a state legislator i tried to get them to uh have an investigation into the massacre i couldn't even get a, a hearing um a state house hearing um you know every speech i give i talk about it when i travel the world i talk about it you'd be surprised how many people heard about kent maybe heard about jackson but definitely didn't hear about orangeburg um the political implications of orangeburg i mean you would have had a maybe a different uh, president, I mean, or at least a vice president at the time. You know, you're, uh, the governor of South Carolina was on the short list, but for this happening to be vice president of the United States. I mean, so you think about all of these things, um, that's the hardest part, but that's our task. And so, you know, I, uh, the wounds have not healed, have not yet healed is the first chapter of the introduction, but the first chapter in my book. And we've sold 100,000 copies. And, um, you know, the goal is that 
trying to tell that truth and teach somebody something um, is what we're here to do. I mean, that's why black journalism is so important. So, so and I know this is hard, Bakari, but I, I can guarantee you because like it's a thing that I know because I'm from South Carolina, but not really like in, I've really kind of heard bits and pieces of it. So I can guarantee you that people watching this kind of don't know what we are talking about when we talk about the Orangeburg massacre. So can you kind of give them a Wikipedia first paragraph version of I mean, uh, the Cliff Notes? The Cliff Notes version is quite simple. You know, kids were protesting the All Star Bowling Alley, which is a whites only bowling alley. They protested for uh, on on February sixth, um, and then on February eighth, after they protested, they went back to their campus, had this huge bonfire, and state troopers fired shots into the students. They killed three. They wounded nearly thirty others. Um, this was actually, uniquely enough, the first and only time in our state's history, in our country's history that, well, first time and only time at that time that law enforcement officers have been charged with federal um, rights crimes. They all went to trial. They were all found not guilty. Um, my dad was shot. He was also arrested. He was also uh, denied bond. Um, and uh, he was charged with five felony counts, looking at a maximum of 75 years. Um, Indictment was backdated, and he was subsequently charged, tried, and convicted of rioting, becoming the first and only man riot in the history of this country. And he went um, back then. What did they they called it hard labor? So he went and, and ended up serving a year in prison of, of hard labor. So he he got a pardon, but it still shows on his record because he wanted everybody to be able to see the injustice that had occurred. He it's kind of crazy. He refused to. Is we're talking about Michael, he refused to erase history. But that that's key, right? Like you're asking us, well, how do we get the story out? Bakaria is a is a direct descendant of someone that was involved in that. And his father's refusal to be formally accepted and erased is our key to telling those stories. There have been many times, and I've seen Michael, your threads, your black history threads, where you will bring up something and someone will be in the quote tweets. Or in your comments and like, I know that was my grandmother. That was my grandfather. That was my uncle. Oh, I lived on it. I, I have seen this happen in real time. And it's like, how do you fight written documentation? By going to the source. By going to the children of the people in which that happened. By going to the people that were actually there. I mean, the way I see it in a broader sense is, why does it seem like white people try so hard to suppress what really happened? Like when I when I went to when I went to the you know the South Carolina myself, and I still tell people South Carolina is one of if not the most beautiful state I've ever been to. So when I went to Dolphusky Island, when I went to St. Helena, for example, when I went to Hilton Head, and you'd hear the people talk about how their cemeteries are are being built over, for example, or when I went to you know Glen County in in Georgia. And I had a descendant of someone whose people toiled at Butler Island Plantation. When you go there to the historical marker, you don't hear anything. You don't read anything about the, the, the enslaved people that worked those rice plantations, the conditions, how brutal it was. There's nothing there. The only historical marker there is talking about Fanny Kemble, who wrote about her experiences there. So if we're gonna just take written documentation. What are you gonna say? Who who did the who did all this cultivation? Who built those levees? Though and and just like you said earlier, Michael, like these are people who I spoke to, just like you and Bakari, who can say I am the sixth or seventh generation of X, Y, and Z. I know where my people were enslaved. I live down the block from there. But the the interesting thing about all of this is that it also in erasing our history, it also erases their history. It's not like there's a separate version of history where black people exist in a vacuum and mm -hmm. our actions don't affect the rest of the country. Like mm -hmm. by erasing the Orangeburg massacre, all of the people in South Carolina don't know why their governor was a step away from becoming vice president of the United States, right? Like yeah. they were willing to wipe away that entire part of South Carolina's history just so they wouldn't have to uncover the stuff that they did to black people, right? Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about, you know, 
my my family's history, right? I remember I visited a, a, a plantation. I was asked to write a story about the plantation industry in South Carolina, in mm. Charleston specifically. And I visited a plantation oh. where wow. the McLeod family lived and they had like between 75 and 125 slaves, depending on the time when this plantation was in existence. Mm. And it like, you know, in, in my book, I talk about this place as like, I literally believe it's the most important piece of property in American history, right? Mm -hmm. When the British invaded the South for the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. they came to this plantation. This mm -hmm. was the plantation that the Confederates mm -hmm. used during the siege of Charleston. It was then the Union took over it. Then it became the first Freedmen's Bureau. This is where they literally gave people the certificates for 40 acres and a mule, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one mm -hmm. plantation and no more than three people, three white people lived in this plantation house at one time or you know at any given time but when you visit the plantation they tell the story of the three people the three white people mm -hmm. instead of the hundreds of black people which is an insane mm -hmm. idea because you mm -hmm. don't know history you're telling the story right. like on james island where this plantation is there were 300 white people uh 1700 slaves right and you, if yeah. you tell the story of the 300 white people you're not, it's not black history, it's the history of the island. It's the American right. history of the island. So right. in erasing right. that, they're not telling the history. Think how many families have been birthed from two of them in that time, in that time of 200, 150, 200 years. And they all over, you know what I'm saying? And I, and, and, and to add on to your point about the, the amount of enslaved people on a plantation, it's like, I think about, again, going back to South Carolina, going back to the Sea Islands, the rice plantations, these were isolated areas where the enslaved people outnumbered the white people. And in fact, that's why, for example, Gullah Geechee people have retained so many West African traditions was because they were so communal, was because they were isolated from white people a lot of the time, right? I mean... Plantation tours, as we know them, with the example, with the exception of the Whitney plantation, is they're not going to tell you everything. They're not. Even, they're not. I, I mean, one example I'll give you is I don't know if you're familiar with Cane River, Cane River in Natchitoches, Louisiana. The story of a French merchant, Pierre Thomas Matoire, who had relations with an enslaved black woman, Marie Quanquan. And and her people were at one point their 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 children were at one point the rich the wealthiest free people of color in the nation at the time. We went on a plantation tour. I went with a seventeenth descendant of this woman and this man. They said nothing about Marie Quan Quan. Despite the only thing that the, the the tour guide said was that her name was derived from Marie Quack Quack because she talked too much. That's it. There was nothing else talked about her her industrial nature. There was nothing talked about the wealth that her people amassed. It was about how it was turned into an art, artist colony, the white people that took over, nothing. And I'm standing next to the 17th descendant trying to pick up how she's feeling going through these grounds and, and you know, he didn't hear anything about her family and there were pictures of her family in the in the in the dining room no one said anything about them we went back home to her parents house her mother who passed away um after my book was released um but she was a huge proponent of creole culture the first thing she asked me when we said we went there she's like why would you go there what, what, that's not for us why would you even go there it's not it's not going to give you it's not going to give you the truth. It's not going to tell you about the torture, the amount of families that are separated, all those sorts of things. But they will tell you about the the majestic nature of the magnolia trees. They'll tell you that. So my my family was enslaved in what was it doesn't exist anymore, but um part of Sumter County and part of Lee County in South Carolina, which you know had a bunch of Gullah Geechee people in it. They uh they had a district called the Salem district and then they kind of merged the two counties. And so the Salem district doesn't even have deep, didn't even, doesn't even exist 
anymore. But my mother was able to dig up the will of my great, 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 great grandfather, who basically when he was going to, I don't know why, we, we can't figure out why, but like near the end of his life, he wrote out his will and divided each of his slaves up amongst his children, children by name. And, uh, you know, my ancestor, who was Irvin, was, again, the troublemaker. So he says, look, in South Carolina, it was, you know, it was uh, illegal to manumit a slave, to free a slave. But you could do it through your will. Just what they would say is he, he is to have his own time. So in order that his children wouldn't inherit this troublemaking slave, he freed him because Irvin could read. Irvin, he was just a troublemaker. So he freed Irvin, but Irvin and but Irvin was married and he gave Irvin's wife to his daughter who lived in Charleston. So she was married to a guy who owned an estate in Charleston. And so like Irvin between like 1850 and the end of the Civil War he just kept being arrested for trying to get to Charleston to find his wife, who was who they called Delia the nurse. And he never did. So there, there's a whole side of like my legitimate family. Like they had children who they don't know. We don't know where they are. Like people didn't know about Tulsa until Watchmen came out, right? which is a sad commentary of where we are as a country. Um, you know, you know how many people I speak to, black and white, who are like, oh my God, there was a massacre in Tulsa? And they get it from what is, what is, what is decently a sci-fi series. By the way, Watchmen was really good. Um, people don't know why um, white folk keep falling in the water in Lake Lanier. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know that Lake, Lake Lanier is on the top. Why don't black folk go to Lake Lanier? We know better. It's on the, it, it literally was, it was literally built on the top of like a black community. There, there are 30, 40, 50 lakes that were built on the top of, of black communities. Um, and so you ask a good question, like how do we preserve the now? And I think that one of the things that we have a better opportunity to do is actually use social media for some good. Uh, we have an opportunity to use our Twitter and our Instagram and our Snapchat and our TikTok for good because we get to dictate our lives today. Do you know how much you know police don't get away with now because of the of the iPhone and the camera on the phone? And so I just think that we, I mean, out of nothing else but sheer fear have to make sure that we're dictating our now. And a lot of that means that we have to preserve our institutions, um, whether or not it's HBCUs, whether or not it's churches, whether or not it's civic organizations or whether or not it's journalistic organizations. We have to preserve those organizations because as we document the now, we need a place to hold and capture the now. And it's those institutions that will hold and capture that now. So this that's an important point because I think, you know, as black people, especially young black people tend to get more radical. We sit, we tend to think, oh, there's no need for, you know, some of the, like, why the church is a white man's religion. Why are we tied to the church? Or what's the need, what's the use for the NAACP or all these uh, institutions that we've built and our ancestors have built over time and it's important like we wouldn't we probably wouldn't be here we definitely wouldn't have as much of a sense of who we are because these institutions weren't built for just the sake of having a fraternity or a place to gather or a meeting to go to on saturdays they were literally built to preserve our lives and in preserving our lives just they were able to kind of, we can trace ourselves through that history of the NAACP, through these institutions that we've built. Like, the, and to go back to what Morgan said earlier, that HBCUs are another valuable research 
thing. Just, you know, these institutions that have been existing since the 1800s, they have a lot of our hist the histories of our ancestors, whether they were enrolled, whether they were janitors, whether they were, you know, students that never graduated, um, whether they had kids whose parents uh, attended there or, or sent them there. Um, a lot of these, or the, there are a lot of the keys to our past lie in the archives of these institutions. If you go search through the roles and search through the histories and archives of these institutions, and they have been intent on preserving these histories. They have the collected papers of so-and-so. They have the, uh, you know, the writings of some of their faculty members. So who have documented our histories? So these are the collective institutions. But so it's almost time for us to wrap up. But what I'd like to ask you guys is, besides the step-by-step -step guide to tracing steps, what, what do you, how can you, what do you give to the people who are watching this and listen as to why they should, even if they're not writing a book, even if they aren't doing a research project, why they should make this endeavor to recover the stolen histories and the lost histories of their ancestors and their families? I would say because it's a point, it's a way to how we survive. Um, don't let the stories of your people be told by other people that aren't your people. <laughs> that's not eloquent, but that's what I'm trying to get across. Um, it's for our survival, it's for our healing, um, and perhaps also our reconciliation. Um, that's why I say that these stories are important. Even if you're not writing a book, I think there's a certain pride to be able to say who your great grandparents were and perhaps even to venerate them if you so choose. I think there's a pride in saying, you know, this is, this is the plantation where they were enslaved. Um, this is the places where they worked. Um, this is the church that they got thrown out of because they were drunk. It adds texture to your family's history. It also get, perhaps gives more uh, detail to how you got here. You know, how we all got here because someone kept on and that's what we need to do for them and for the future. No, I think it's important because as we dictated today, it gets lost. Our history gets lost. And I think one of the things that we have to do is, is ensure that we're not doomed to repeat it, right? I think that um, it's important that we take an active role and ensuring that we're the ones telling our story. I think, Michael, you laid it out the best at the beginning of this. Like, we're not the ones who have uniquely told our history. Um, it's something that Baldwin fought for. It's something that Langston Hughes fought for. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and we're continuing that fight today. And I do think that the root is uniquely positioned to tell that story and preserve that story. And to close out, I'd just like to add that it's not just your story, right? there's someone who needs you to tell their story so they can figure out their story, right? Who, who, because even though we're not a monolith, black people in this country are tied together. Even if I have no connection to you, if I am from South Carolina and you are from South Carolina, knowing and reading and, and seeing your story gives me information about my story, if my story has been erased, right? There is a lot of us who can't retrace our stories, which is why it is important for you to tell yours because all of our stories are intertwined and we need your stories, no matter who you are, they are as important as the most famous black persons in America's story. And that's why we have to tell them because we are all the same at some point. And I'd like to thank you guys for joining me. I'd like to commend My Vanishing Country and, and, and I'm sorry, Morgan, uh, Kyle, <laughs> the, the, the new novel. Kyle oh, right? baby, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and all of which, all of her works, right? She has a, a previous, uh, novel that, that she's written. My phone has died, so I can't look up the, the title for that. But all of Morgan Jer uh, Jerkin's work and her current work on The Undefeated, where she tells our stories for us, 
which is what the undefeated is. So I'd like to commend all of that to you. And thank you for joining us. And you guys check out all of the other videos and all of the other classrooms in the Root Institute. Have a great day.